Pablo, you are a piano player, you're a composer, band leader, organizer, the list goes on. And on the top of that, also a documentarist on YouTube. So you make all those mm -hmm. interviews, you've got your own uh, podcast, you've got your own program that is called Pablo Held Invest Investigates. You run mm -hmm. your uh, Pablo Held trio. And you're also co-founder of your jazz collective in your area. Is that correct? That's correct. It's called Clang, and we've been doing it since 2009 or 10, organizing festivals, concert series. We have a label and, yeah, uh, d different other stuff as well. So, yeah, it's been good to work with those guys together. Those are my friends, and we like to put on the concerts and f festivals uh, that we would like to go on uh, ourselves, you know, that we would like to uh, be a listener as uh, at... Uh, ourselves you know Pablo could you tell me why did you start Pablo investigates why did you start a project and how did you start it afterwards what was the main objective mm. for you personal reasons business reasons yeah. could be anything mm -hmm. um, well the first story is that um, there was a film that is still didn't come out yet but there's a film which is uh, being made about wayne charter and in 2013 they uh, did a crowdfunding campaign and uh one of the perks uh, was that you could uh chip in money and then get uh, an exclusive interview with wayne charter 20 minute skype interview i got that um, because I'm, I'm a huge fan of Wayne and he's like my, my idol. So I had to get involved and I also got into contact with the director and was like, okay, do you need any press contacts in Germany so we can make more noise about this movie? So we, were, we get, got into contact. I, I purchased this, this perk. And meanwhile, also I sent her a, a track of mine playing a song of Joni Mitchell's and asked her if she would uh, bring it to Wayne before the interview so Wayne could maybe comment on it and give me some advice and she did and um, I had a great conversation with Wayne but before that um, I made sure that I record this conversation because I wanted to basically uh, yeah uh, remind myself of it and and have something of a rem remembrance and be able to tell myself that it was actually happening that I was talking to my to my idol. So I recorded it, but privately, uh, secretly, found a software that did that with Skype. And um, I showed this to my friends afterwards also. I can't, you know, I was very insecure about everything that I said, because what do you say after Wayne Charter, you know? So, so you just let him talk in a way, you know? That was my, one of the lessons I got out of that. But over the years, I kept this video and sometimes showed it to friends and uh, watched it myself. And at some point I was like, I, I should share this with more people because he's saying so many great things. And also he's talking to a musician. He can open up more a little bit, you know? So I thought of that, had that in the back of my head. Um, head. And then also I noticed then whenever I got the chance to play with somebody I admire, I would ask them questions all the time. Uh, I would ask them about everything because I always thought, you know, this will be the last chance that, you know, even maybe there's a bit of, I don't really trust that this is happening. You know, I'm playing with John Schofield. How can this be, you know? So I, I made sure that I may, you know, took advantage of the situation to be in a rehearsal, in a, in a, in a restaurant, in a, in a bus with that kind of a person, take advantage of that situation and ask him questions and get, get you know involved with with what they what their process is so I, i've been doing that always and also i've been doing that when this is not you know a huge hero of mine just a colleague um when you sit in a car you ask each other about the process and meanwhile i got more and more upset or um um not content with the way that most interviewers, journalists 
do their interviews because usually they look at their notes while you're answering their question. Um, they ask you something like in a tongue in cheek way. So they, in they, they are the ones that are being uh, in the spotlight because they have such a clever question or something. Okay. <laughs> and it's, it's very, very, it's very, very rarely about connection and interaction. And it's more about you're this kind of a guy, right? And then you're like, no, <laughs> even if you are. You're making you're me like, nervous. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> you started it. No, uh, no, no, it's totally fine. Um, so uh, there, this was the cocktail of, of things that I was thinking about. And also, I'm such a big fans, fan of interviews. I'm reading interview books. I'm reading biographies. I'm watching interviews. I'm listening to podcasts. I always like uh, listening to people talk to each other and also I had noticed that there's uh, conversations going on where I can sometimes not follow the technical uh, uh, insights of the conversation but I'm still interested because I like listening to people who know what they're talking about I really like that so this kind of thing gave me um, gave me the confidence or, or the um, impetus to just try it and um, record conversations with with friends and colleagues and, and guys I admire. But the first thing was to release, I wanted to start with the Wayne thing. So I had to get in touch with those guys again. I was like, yeah, to be honest, I recorded our conversation. Could you ask Wayne for permission for me to go ahead and publish it? Here's a transcript of it. And they were like, Pablo, you shouldn't have done this. You know, this is not good, you know? another lesson to be learned <laughs> but back then i didn't intend to start a re interview series you know it, it it all all builds on on top of that so but wayne gave his permission so i started with that and then i started uh talking to mike gibbs nelson veras uh, larry goldings uh, and then i thought maybe if i talk to larry I'm sure Bill Stewart would be up too. Let's ask him. So I asked him. And a lot of interviews are connected with each other. So people I talk to maybe uh, recommended me to somebody else, you know, or I asked them, could you maybe put me in touch with them? Or uh, we knew each other before, or it's just friends that I play with, you know, or people that I have been in touch with before, or there's people who I have uh, not known before and just out of the blue, got in touch with them and said, I'm a fan of your music, let's talk. So um, yeah, it's a mixture of, I love uh, listening to interviews. I don't love um, bad interviews. <laughs> and um, also I like talking to people. And, um, I, and also I thought, you know, there's, it's a long answer, I'm sorry. But um, I, I thought that if I'm sitting in a car talking to my colleagues, uh, asking them about their process. I'm sure all my idols, when they sit in a car with their colleagues, they, they're doing the same thing. How can I be a fly on the wall in, if, in that situation? Maybe if they don't ask me for their gig, which is understandable, uh, maybe I can create an environment where I can still ask them those questions without having a gig with them, you know? <laughs> You, you mentioned so many wonderful names, so many wonderful musicians, but also they range from different styles and different styles within right. the jazz idiom. Could be free jazz, could be up to, you know, swing and bebop or something that is traditional because we have them already as those iconic records. Mm -hmm. uh, do you still feel nervous? How do you deal with a stressful situation like this? Because I saw that was your question to John Scofield. You know, as he grows older and older, does he still get the same butterflies before the gig starts, before the mm. next big things happen? Uh, did you already build up your certain work and routine when you go, now I feel comfortable when I go and talk to these people because I'm prepared for the interview or because mm. I know their work so well? Yeah. You've got confidence in you. So how do you look at it at the moment? Mm, it's different. It's different. Um, usually when I know, you know, I'm not, I wasn't uh, super nervous when I talked to Larry Goldings because we hung out before. So there's a common thing there. 
but I recently had an interview with Maria Schneider that's going to be released next. And I was super nervous because I didn't know her and I didn't really have a feeling about how she is as a person. Um, I looked at interviews and she seemed totally nice, but still I felt like, um, yeah, it's it's usually a way after the, the first couple of minutes because you get a sense of how somebody is reacting to you and how you can, can um, uh, build a, um, a secure or a, a um, relaxed environment for, for them to open up, you know, and also yourself to open up. It's not just them. Because if you uh, start the conversation from an insecure standpoint, um, that transfers back to them and that creates insecurity in general and, and, and weird feelings, you know. And these, you know, I, I said those things about the, the bad interviewers and I can, f now that I'm doing it, I can feel with them because the thing is, I'm, I have a lot of notes and they're sort of my uh, safety um, net, helmet yeah. or, or safety net or whatever, because I have that to go to if nothing is happening. I have my questions, you know. But um, with some interviews, like the Ben Street interview, he started out asking me something. And that shows already how, um, how, how somebody approaches that um, situation. Like, um, is it going to be a questionnaire? And I'm only here to answer, or are we engaging? Is this a thing, you know? And there's nothing bad with um, with a questionnaire and, and somebody who's there to answer questions. That's totally fine, you know? But uh, sometimes people approach it differently and that um, can create other, other starting points then. But I can really feel with those guys who have their notes and you see the security in those notes because, um, so you get attached to them, you know, you see, oh, this could be a nice question or this could be something. And I can really feel also with those guys already thinking about what might be next when somebody's answering the question. Although, um, but I always get back to reminding myself like, like it's in me, it's like how it is in music. If you think about what's next, you're already lost. And I tell myself, before each interview is like I have all these notes but I might just ask one question or say a remark that because it, that can also start the conversation it doesn't have to be a question it can be a remark um, and then I'll just listen like I'm a mu musician I am a musician so I'll just listen and then interact and then react to what's coming and that doesn't have to be connected to my notes at all. Although it might, you know, it usually might be because the notes are very, very broad and very, um, they, they cover a lot of ground. I try to cover a lot of ground with my research or, and also I have to remind myself, and I've done this before now a couple of times just to do the interview without notes because I have to remind myself, these are my heroes. So I have been preparing for the conversation my whole life. And I don't need notes because I didn't need notes when I was in the car with Schofield asking him questions. I didn't need notes to talk to him. You don't need notes to talk to a person. You know, I might ha have a nice conversation with a person I don't know at all. And we don't know anything about each other. If we just connect, that's fine, you know. So the notes are a means to get into the process for me too, because for before each interview, I. I listen to the music of that person for a week or so, uh, only this music and try to go back to all my favorites, but also fill in some gaps of records that I haven't known before, you know, and then, and then just write down the notes sometimes as observations or sometimes as, okay, this field is something that interests me or this actual quote is something that I like from an interview because I also watch interviews, <laughs> which is weird, but also sometimes helpful, you know. You, you see the both sides, the people that are mm. looking up and trying to go up and up and they're the young students, right? And they've got their idols and they've got their passion and drive. And 
also you've got your own career ahead. I mean, you know, the career has got so many spectrums. It's the music mm-hmm. you want to play. It's also the musicians you want to play with. Uh, mm-hmm. You're you're always very kind to credit, you know, your bass player and your drummer. So I've, I've got Robert Landefermann here. Mm-hmm. So that, that's the correct name. How would you pronounce mm-hmm. it? How would you pronounce it? Robert Landfermann. Okay. And Jonas is? Jonas Burgwinkel. Burgwinkel. Uh, did mm-hmm. you guys meet also when you were in a school or were yes. there musicians that started hiring you and uh, you just became friends? No, I mean, uh, we, for real, we met uh, when I came to study in Cologne and they were already established there. I mean, they were a couple of years older than me, so they were still studying and I came in as the new guy to, to study at the school. And um, But before I met each one of them separately, at a jam session in Dortmund, a town near where I uh, grew up. And I, Dortmund was the next big, big thing next to Hagen where I grew up. So, and I also did a kind of a pre-study thing there in, in Dortmund, which was very, very helpful and very, uh, I learned a lot there. And also they had a, a scene with sessions and, and Hagen didn't have anything of, of that. So I had to go to Dortmund to experience what it is, you know, to be at a session and to have rehearsals, to go to concert, concerts and stuff like that. So I, each Monday I would go to the, to the session, to the local session there, play all night, try to learn standards and observe the older people. You know, I was 15 till 17 then or something. And um, Robert and Jonas separately came with different bands to open the session from Cologne. So I, with both of them, I think I got, either I got the chance to play once at the session there, or we just talked, but I made contact with them before. And then I, when I came to Cologne, I um, pretty soon I had a session with them. And then uh, I said, okay, you're my trio now. <laughs> <laughs> you're my boys. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's what they tell me. I, I didn't really hire them. I just said, okay, you, you are my trio now. <laughs> you know, that that is direct community that, that is directly related to you. You're responsible for it. You went on purpose somewhere, you know, and they happened to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, yes. Now, what you started on YouTube with, with, with your work mm-hmm. Suddenly you created a community of musicians and students that never met you in person, but they know your work, right? That's, right. that's, mm-hmm. that must be a strange feeling. What did you learn from this experience that there's actually community outside of your direct reach within one city that, you know, people in the States, in Australia, in China, in Russia, in Europe, they know your work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I, it's, it's little moments where I noticed this. And it's not something I think about the, the whole time. I mean, I'm happy if I get a mail from Australia and there's a guy or New Zealand, I once got a, got a mail and somebody is like, I really like your podcast. This is cool what you do. That makes me happy, obviously, but it's not something that I, I intend to accomplish when I have these conversations. It's really about connecting with those people. But as I said before, I had these conversations before I did the interview series and was like i wish more people would hear this because this i think this would be useful for them too you know and it's something that um is also very ingrained in me usually if i hear a piece or i'm at a concert or i see a movie or i hear a great podcast the first thing when i have a beautiful experience like that is i want to share it with people maybe and often it's, it is, <laughs> it can be a letdown because nobody will have the same experience as you. You know, it's very personal. It's very personal. And sometimes you go with the thing that makes you cry or makes you happy. You go to somebody else and there's like, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> You're like, but don't you see? So I have to realize sometimes also that it's very, very personal, you know, but still I, I, I like the feeling of sharing it with others. And um, well, as I said, there's little moments where I then maybe notice that there's a bunch of people out there who I have never met, but they have enjoyed those interviews. 
th those are really heavy duty experiences that we get, you know, because so someday you get appreciation from Wayne Shorter. John Scofield has got nice, you know, reviews of your work. So, you know, that's a spectrum of an extreme when you're like, wow, this is incredible. Then another, mm -hmm. you know, extreme is that, you know, he you hear the bad things of, you know, people exactly that are sitting on a sofa and, and trolling right. in the middle of a night. Uh, through all these experiences, that's your work. You know, you cannot probably separate. This is my academic life. This is my career life because it blends together so nicely, I have to yes, say. Yeah. Uh, what did you learn about yourself? Wow, that's a big question. I mean, I learn things about myself all the time, you know, and that's also one of the downsides of being an artist, I think, is that you're so involved with yourself the whole time. You think about, ah, can I still do it? <laughs> uh, was this a good solo? Was this a good, uh, you know, you, I just came back from four days of, of studio with friends of mine. And you're so, you know, you have to be careful with the judging mode because, you know, especially in the studio, like, you just did a take and like, is this good? Should we do another one? You know, you're really still very attached to the to the creative process and then you're already judging it, you know? So that's something that I noticed that we, we should take the judging part um, really, really out of the creative, of the time where we're creative, just take the, the, the judging part out of it. Um, doing the interviews is something where I notice things that I have been struggling with in my life as well as in my music is which is patience leaving space that's that's something that I've been getting better at in music and meanwhile in my interviews as well but it's, it's on both levels it's a it's a struggle um, and I'm still working on it but that's something that um, I noticed in my music and then I tried to do something about it, try to talk to people about it also in the interviews. I, I think that's a common theme that comes up pretty often because I need to know, I need to, I need to get other views on it. And then I saw in the interviews that um, sometimes people need time to think, to come up with the even better answer to what they just said. So, in moments like this, even especially on the internet, it's like, this is hard to take in the, on the internet, silence, right? Especially if you're the interviewer, you're like, shit, I'm in charge of the situation actually. What, what should I do? Nobody's saying anything. This is boring. Uh, is this person, you know, is, it, um, is he or she, is she annoyed? Um, you know, what should I do? And in these moments, I usually, steer the conversation somewhere and that's and I, I that sometimes happens in music as well and i might usually have an idea for something so musically or or um or i'll say in, a, in an interview directing then the, the conversation somewhere but that might not be the best thing for the moment and somebody else might still be thinking of of what we just talked about and some people need, even need more time of that you know and um, then I just, I, I talked to my producer who's by now is doing all the editing for the, for the videos. I did it before myself. And um, he was like, yeah, there's sometimes moments where I'm, I see that the other person is still thinking about the topic and they are still trying to work it out and you're already going somewhere else take your courage and, and, um, and leave those moments. And I've been getting better at this. And I think now I'm getting to different um, uh, territories in a, in a conversation. And I really, really like it, but it takes a lot of courage and, and um, restraint on my part. So I, I go like, okay, I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna take this now. <laughs> Oh, wow, why, 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 you know, now they're saying this and we, we can go there now and we couldn't. And I couldn't have come up with this direction now because th they had to think, they had to think about it. So I'm, I'm noticing this, there's something else 
but I need to think. <laughs> Right, I, I've seen, and this is a little bit of a reaffirmation, but um, I read this book about, um, it's called, uh, what's it called? Sapiens. Maybe you read it. As, I, I, haven't, as, I haven't read it, but I'll look it up. It's, um, it's, it's basically a book about the, the human nature and, and its development. Um, basically a story about the, the world. <laughs> Um, by this great guy, and um, he says that in in retrospect, in in history, every great uh, achievement or discovery came uh, because somebody said, "I don't know." And um, this is basically the the crux of the interview series: is saying, "I don't know. Can you tell me?" Yeah. And a lot of times in interviews, we want to act or in, in conversations, in musical settings, we want to act as if we know everything because it's hard to admit that you don't, you know, and it's not being honest uh, if, you, if you then go like, yeah, I know, you know. <laughs> but saying I don't know really, really uh, is more, I, I realized that it's more, um, you know, it's connotated with, being a weakness you don't know something but it's actually saying it out loud i don't know i need help can you help me uh, is uh, is a strength mm -hmm. and i've i've been noticing this and i've tried to i'm trying to let this more into my into my system somehow and i realized that this is actually yeah as i said the the basis for doing interviews it's like I need to know, tell me, because if I knew, I wouldn't ask you, you know. <laughs> In investigates, I, uh, I'm yeah, sure that, you know what it I'm sounds great. About. It sounds like a great title, you, you know, and also what you said, I don't know, tell me that that could be your next project. <laughs> sound, sound, <laughs> sounds like a project project for a TED talk. You should do that, Pablo. <laughs> Uh, so your interviews come from your own inspiration. From what you're saying, it's basically your own life experience, your own questions. I don't know. You tell me. And as well, you're a well-rounded guy that is you know, nerdy about stuff. You research this. Uh, do you have any podcasts you could recommend? Uh, somebody that you like listening to uh, and could be not only podcasts, could be a local teacher that you like. Uh, uh, because you had actually quite few teachers on piano that you're very happy uh, that you were lucky that you crossed your path with them. Uh, mm -hmm. So could you just reference those very quickly for me? Yeah. Um, my favorite podcast is WTF with Mark Marin, And I've been listening to that. I was hipped to that podcast by uh, Phil Donkin, great uh, British bass player who lives in Germany. And he uh, noted, you know, we were on tour in 2015, I think, with a band or, or 13, I think. Yeah, it's been that long. Um, so we, we were on tour with the band and, um, and he, we always talked about music and uh, movies and comedians. We were both um, very inspired and... and um, interested in, in comedy and um, he said yeah I'm listening to this podcast the whole time this is uh, basically a, uh, a, comi a, a comic um, comedian guy who uh, who was struggling with his own career and then he uh, you know he it didn't really take off although he was on the scene for a long time he then started talking to his colleagues friends and people he'd admired um, in his garage and uh, started a podcast and became somehow the king of podcasts um, up and until you know by now he has done over a thousand episodes in the beginning people came to his garage to talk not for promo reasons that has changed um, I have to say but still they came to his garage not to 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 uh, promote a music uh, uh, um, an, an album or 
uh, a movie or a new you know comedy hour or something they came to talk and he was really he was opening up towards them they were opening up to towards him and there's so many great uh, episodes of him talking to people <laughs> i think the, the climax was at some point obama came to his garage to talk to him and that was incredible but um, uh, so he's a big influence on how I do it. Uh, he actually listening to him showed me how I can start a conversation, how I can engage in a conversation uh, to make it happen in a way. Also, how can you talk to people? I learned I learned about that from him. I think. Then I really like Conan O'Brien needs a friend. Uh, it's a very cool podcast and very funny. One of the greatest episodes, actually, when Mark Maron came to Conan O'Brien. Um, then there's a lot of jazz podcasts. I mean, uh, I like the one by Dave Douglas. That's nice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, um, what, did I, what else did I listen to? Um, I mean, I le read a lot of books also with interviews and, you know, interviews with, with anybody. Really, I lo lo love reading about masters, how mm. they arrive in, or how they get to the creative process. I also did this uh, notebook that's related to oh, yeah. the interview. I was series. wondering, what is that? So investigation notes. Yeah, because I always write down notes. Mine is still not full, my old one. So, but what I do is this, <clears throat> let me show you. Always when I, when I find something that inspires me, that I like, I write it down. So I have a book full of inspiration of things that I don't want to forget. I always put a date, you know, similar. So I designed this and it's made, you know, it's uh, produced eco-friendly and everything is fair.